Who are some of the people who hated their employers so much that they decided to scam them? Let's get right into it with number six, Prison Baby. Jaspreet Mann, businesswoman turned con woman, scammed her company out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mann created two fake companies to siphon off funds while she worked as a corporate headhunter at Mega, an engineering corporation based in the UK. Her role wasn't literally hunting heads like you would enthusiastically hope. She was actually just responsible for recruiting talent for the company and was sometimes allowed to approach those candidates through outside agencies. Mann set up two recruitment companies and even made her unsuspecting mother a fellow director. Anytime she recruited someone directly, she would still submit bogus invoices on behalf of her fake companies to Megat. During an internal audit, Megat uncovered her scheme. They confronted her, and she immediately confessed to the scam and resigned. Acknowledging the crime wasn't enough for the vengeful Megat who contacted the police. In Warwick Crown Court in Northern England, she pleaded guilty to fraud by abuse of a position of trust and acquiring criminal property. Judge Barry Berlin found her guilty and sentenced her to two and a half years in prison. While waiting for her sentencing, Mann found out she was pregnant with her first child. Her lawyer asked for leniency from the judge to avoid her giving birth in prison. Man's good character was pushed and she was painted someone that lost their way. She was already embarrassed and was going to struggle to find new employment as it was. Further, it was highlighted that Man didn't use the money to live an extravagant life and voluntarily repaid £272,000 of the £335,000 she stole. The judge, however, was a no-mercy type of judge. For him, the scam was premeditated, systematic, and lasted over nine months. Man didn't deserve leniency simply because she already paid back half of what she stole, admitted fault, and had a good reason to stay out of trouble. Clearly, she was a continued menace to society. Prisoners that give birth in the UK can stay with their babies until they're 18 months old. During that time, they're placed in a mother and baby unit. After the infant turns 18 months old, they're put in the care of social services who find a suitable home. Sometimes the child goes to a family member and others to a foster family. The judge's decision meant Mann's prison sentence would begin a few months before she gave birth. And since she would be there for longer than 18 months, social services would take the baby from her while she still had several months left in her sentence. Number five, the sick king. Neva Lazi stole $780,000 from her boss, Sydney adult store owner, Con Ange. Ange was receiving overseas treatment for a motor neuron disease and left the store in the hands of his employees, including Lazi. Between 2015 and 2020, she made 380 transactions from business bank accounts into her personal accounts. Lazi used the money to fund a lifestyle that included lavish vacations and an expensive wedding. She also rented a harbor view of apartment in Cindy's Point Piper suburb, one of the richest in the country. The 380 transactions came about as Lazi claimed that Ange paid her in an unconventional way to avoid paying taxes. She claimed that all of the money was given to her legitimately as Ange only paid her in cash. Ange explained that Lazi was only a part-time employee and he paid her $500 a week for administrative work like timesheets and organization of finances, including payroll. Lazi, however, described herself as the chief financial officer of the Ange Group, a chain of Ange's adult entertainment stores across Australia, including New South Wales, Queensland, and Victoria. Despite making business cards and touting the title to those around her, Ange claimed never gave her that position. In fact, her role and responsibilities never changed during her employment. Ange had to leave the country for his safety after someone firebombed his business office and he was assaulted. Around that same time, Ange also learned that he had a debilitating motor neuron disease that was terminal, where Ange was being dealt a pretty bad at hand, Lazi saw an opportunity. With Ange absent, she could perform hundreds of bank transfers into her own account without him finding out. Further, Lazi wasn't even doing the job she was hired to do. She didn't even file the company's tax returns. Ange believed this was because she didn't care about doing them since he would probably die soon anyway. During his court appearance, Ange explained that he was preoccupied after being diagnosed with a terminal degenerative motor neuron disease, having his business get firebombed, and being assaulted. Normal things that may distract you enough 
enough for you to not notice that an employee is stealing. At the time he left Lazi in charge, she was highly regarded within the organization and had established trust with Ange and her co-workers. With his company in good hands, Ange felt he was free to worry about other things, like staying alive. Lazi was notably anxious in court and asked not to be jailed as people relied on her for care, including young children. Ange, apparently running only on vengeance, feared he would not live to see Lazi sentenced. At that point, he was finding it difficult to even breathe on his own and required assistance for even simple tasks. Initially, Lazi received a prison sentence of four years with a non-parole period of three years. The judge hoped the ruling would warn others against similar crimes. He believed that her motive was to fund a lifestyle that Lazi wouldn't have been able to afford on her wages alone. Lazi maintained her innocence and showed no remorse when she received her sentence. She filed an appeal against her conviction and sentence and applied for bail, which the judge denied as he didn't feel the appeal would be successful. However, authorities uncovered fresh evidence during the appeal process, which affected the outcome of Lazi's convictions. Lazi's individual charges hadn't been considered separately during the hearing at the insistence of the police prosecution and Lazi's defense lawyer. She received multiple unfair convictions as a result and had some of her charges dismissed. The judge overturned half of her convictions and resentenced her to 19 months and 23 days imprisonment that would be served in the community as an intensive correction order. In Australia, an intensive correction order is a custodial sentence served in the community. Number 4. Choo Choo Scam Former Virgin Trains employee Shahid Anwar defrauded £116,300 from his employer in a compensation scam that he ran for over three years. When Anwar ran into hard times financially, he noticed some flaws in Virgin Trains' delay and repay that he could exploit. Virgin Trains' delay and repay policy refunded customers a portion of their ticket if their train was delayed. Between March 2016 and March 2019, Anwar scammed Virgin Trains £116,000 £16,300 and had attempted to collect another £50,000. The refunds range from £9 to £746, and in some cases, Anwar transferred the money to family members, though it doesn't appear that they were aware the money was stolen. Anwar also claimed he wasn't using the money to fund a lavish lifestyle. Rather, he was at the supermarket buying food. But with that kind of money, he must have been shopping at Whole Foods. Anwar processed over 1,500 transactions and admitted that the racket became a stupid addiction to the point that he was guessing which trains would be late while he was away from work to get refunds. He photoshopped tickets, then used multiple email addresses and roughly 100 different PayPal accounts to make the claims. During his time with Virgin Trains, Anwar was a highly respected employee that was well-liked among his co-workers. Although he was the only one that got caught taking advantage of the holes in the delay and repay system, it was something that Virgin Train employees were all aware of and spoke about often. Anwar admitted to feeling relieved after his 2019 arrest. Submitting the false claims had become an addiction and he felt he needed to be held accountable for his actions. Following his arrest, Anwar dealt with the public humiliation that this case received and had to tell his wife and parents what he'd done. With his reputation in shambles, he formally apologized in court and said he was glad it was over. However, his case took three years to process with him being arrested in 2019 but not charged until October 2022. It doesn't sound like that's a big deal until you realize he was waiting for news of when his trial would start every every day of that three years. Anwar's lawyer argued that since his arrest, he had worked to better himself, working in a citizen's advice team where he was promoted and earned high praise from his peers. He also insinuated that Anwar had suffered a personal tragedy but wouldn't give details out of concern for embarrassing him and his wife. The judge spared him some prison time, partially due to the emotional toll of waiting for so long for his trial, which was in its own form punishment. Anwar was ordered to spend 20 days of rehabilitation activity and 200 hours of unpaid work. The amount that he'll be required to pay back will be decided at a later date. Number three, sick day scammers. Three prison guards working at Rikers Island took part in a massive sick leave scheme and received hundreds of thousands of dollars from New York City taxpayers. The trio was comprised of Monica Coxum, Eduardo Trinidad, and Stephen Cage. Coxum and Trinidad were engaged. It's like old Pappy used to say, the couple that defrauds together is outlawed together. He was full of great relationship advice like that. Another one was, if she's gonna scam, then she'll steal you a ham. That man loved his hams. 
All three claimed sick leave for extended periods while still collecting their regular salaries. Stephen Cage was out of work from March 2021 to May 2022, but still received his full salary of roughly $160,000. He claimed he was suffering from vertigo and adverse side effects from the COVID-19 vaccine. During this time, Cage devoted himself to working on his graphic novel, Cure of Utopia, which was released in 2021. Around that time, law enforcement officers saw him perform daily activities without signs of being unwell or uninjured. Trinidad reported multiple injuries between June 2021 in November 2022. Whenever he had appointments with city officials, he wore a sling or walked with a cane. Like Cange, he received his full salary, which was over $140,000. He might have gone out of his way to look injured in front of city officials, but pictures surfaced of Trinidad performing household repairs without any signs of physical distress. Coxham also faked injuries and illnesses and was paid her entire $80,000 salary. Coxham and Trinidad traveled together to the Dominican Republic, West Virginia, and Florida, all the while claiming to be too sick to work. Coxham reported injuring her shoulder, wrist, elbow, and knee, while Trinidad claimed he'd hurt his knee, ankle, shoulder, wrist, fingers, hip, and elbow. The pair supposedly had several surgeries for their injuries and afterwards said they couldn't work due to trauma. Once the DOC caught wind of the scheme, the jig was up. Federal agents accessed their phone records and iCloud accounts where they found Coxham bragging about defrauding her lawyer. In a group chat, she spoke about staying home and still getting paid. Each guard's union contract states that a Department of Corrections officer has unlimited paid sick leave for illnesses and injuries that make them incapable of doing their job. Once employees have been on sick leave for more than eight days in one year, they can only leave their homes between 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. This somehow ensures the system isn't being taken advantage of. The pair submitted hundreds of fraudulent documents doctor's notes, and worst of all, repeatedly broke the 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. restriction. Authorities arrested the trio in late 2022. Their charges included federal government, fraud, and cheating an organization that receives federal funds. Rikers Island is a notorious prison that has become known for being dysfunctional. They have dealt with several inmate deaths and suicide attempts, which are often attributed to staffing shortages. The job wasn't great, but the pay was sick. Number two, World Cup Scammer. Fiona Barclay, a Manchester City hospitality executive, stole over $100,000 from the Premier League team when she transferred refunds into her bank account. Barclay was caught when accountants noticed an unusual transaction when a refund of 25,000 pounds was issued, which was such a large whole number. When Barclay was questioned over it, she claimed it was an accident and apologized. Barclay confessed to depositing 15,000 pounds of the money into her own account, then paid it back to the club. However, the club checked into the matter further and found that Barclay had actually been skimming money for a long time. In total, she stole more than 100 104,000 pounds. After an official investigation was launched, Barclay told police she'd used the cash to pay for some of her wedding and had bought gifts for her husband and family. During her hearing, Barclay admitted to fraud by abuse of power. She burst into tears in court and said she used the fraud to cope with her mental health issues. In light of uh, this information, the judge required a psychiatric report on her mental well-being before they move ahead with sentencing. While being lenient, he emphasized that the evaluation didn't mean she wouldn't face jail time. However, the assessment would be a necessary tool in deciding any sort of custodial sentencing. The evidence that authorities uncovered with the assistance of Manchester City combined with her guilty plea made it clear that she was the person behind the scheme. She was premeditated and it lasted for several years. Another factor to consider in Barclay's sentencing was that she appeared to be in the early stages of pregnancy, meaning that she might give birth in prison depending on the length of any potential custodial sentencing. Number one, the devil where black and white. Former Vogue staffer Yvonne Bannigan stole over $53,000 from the magazine's creative director while working as her assistant. Bannigan became Grace Coddington's assistant in 2016 after briefly working at Vogue. She worked for Coddington for two years and during that time stole tens of thousands of dollars from her boss through charges to Coddington's credit card. During that time, Bannigan also sold Coddington's holdings to Real Reddit an online consignment shop where she made $9,000. Bannigan had her dream job, having gone from being an assistant at Vogue to working with one of the fashion scene's most influential figures. In 2016, as well as being hired by Connington, Bannigan appeared alongside her in a teen Vogue spread. 
Having been thrown into a world of wealth and luxury, Bannigan could have never lived the same lifestyle as those around her on her assistant salary. Coddington was a mentor to Brannigan. She didn't give orders and preferred collaborating with her assistants, valuing their opinions. By all accounts, Coddington was great to work for. Coddington and Bannigan shared a connection. As Coddington immigrated to the U.S. from a rural town in Wales and Bannigan moved to New York from Ireland. However, two years after they started working together, Coddington filed a complaint against Bannigan. Through her lawyer, Bannigan expressed confusion over the charges. She was very close to Coddington and nursed her through several surgeries and a stroke. Coddington never mentioned misuse of her credit cards to her. In fact, Bannigan said she was the one that encouraged Coddington to report suspicious charges on her credit card to the police. Coddington didn't necessarily seem to be someone that frequently checked their credit card bills. She was very wealthy and in the years leading up to the alleged theft had signed a book deal rumored to be worth $1.2 million. Her home was featured an architectural digest and filled with expensive photography and artwork. She spent her money on frivolous things like a psychic or a cat. Bannigan's charges were second and third degree grand larceny. Although she initially tried to label her crimes as a misunderstanding, she pleaded guilty to one count of fourth degree larceny. In May 2019, the Manhattan Supreme Court sentenced Brannigan to three years probation. She had already performed 15 days of community service under her plea deal. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section, would you rather have a job that pays 500K with a five vacation days per year or a job that pays 100K with 60 vacation days per year.